So we've been thinking about the kingdom of God and what it means to seek that first in our life. And I trust we've understood something not only in theory, but something that we could practice in the days to come. The only way to seek in a way that you find, you remember Jesus spoke about a widow who kept on knocking until she got and a man who went to his neighbor's house for food at midnight and kept on knocking until he got. There were only two parables Jesus spoke on prayer. And in both of those parables, those are the ones I just mentioned, Luke 11 and Luke 18. One was the man who went to his neighbor's house and asked for food at midnight. And the man said, I'm asleep, I can't just open and give it to you. And he kept on knocking. It was shameless persistence. We wouldn't do that. I mean, if you went to a person's house at midnight and he said, don't disturb me, you'd go away. But he kept on, he said, I want it. I want something for someone who has come to my house. I've seen through the years, it's those who have such a burden to help needy people. That person who came to his house, the picture of a needy person who go to God and say, Lord, I will not give up until you give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to serve the needy people around me. Those are the people who get. Those who pray and knock for a little while, they don't get anything and go home and say, well, I prayed and God didn't give it to me. I can tell you in a hundred years, you won't get anything. Jesus taught persistence. There are certain things we don't know whether it's God's will or not. Is it God's will for you to have a better house? I don't know. A better car? I don't know. A better job? I don't know. Is it God's will for you to get married? I don't know. But one thing I do know, it is God's will that you should possess his kingdom. But you've got to be a man of violence to get it. You could have understood everything that you heard in the last couple of days and spend the next year not possessing the kingdom because you're not persistent. You give up easily. Jesus spoke about the other widow. You know, it's interesting how Jesus always pictured the church as not a lion or something big. How did Jesus picture the church? A sheep. Sheep are some of the most helpless animals. They're pretty stupid too because They'll follow the sheep in front, and if the sheep in the front jumps over a cliff, they go over a cliff too. That's why sheep need a shepherd. And the other picture he used of the church is a widow. In Luke 18, it's a widow went to his, the judge saying, give me justice against my enemy. You know that story, and that's why I'm not turning to the verse. You know Luke 18. Think of that. A widow with no male member in his ho her house, her husband is dead. And if she had a son, she would have sent the son. Even if she had a daughter, she would have sent the daughter to the judge. But this is this old lady with no husband, no son, no daughter. Can you think of a more helpless widow than that? And here's a neighbor who is encroaching into her property, moving the fence and taking more and more of this poor widow's property. And she's not strong enough to fight against the neighbor. And that's the devil. So she goes to the judge, and that's a judge who doesn't fear God or man. And she says, she says, I'm not asking for anybody else's property. Give me justice against my enemy. I'm asking for my rightful property. And the judge says, I'm not going to listen to you. I have no time for that. So she goes and knocks at his door at 2 o'clock in the morning and disturbs him day and night till finally that judge who doesn't fear God or man, you read the whole thing in Luke 18, verse 1 to 7, says, okay, I'll do something because she's persistent disturbing me. And Jesus said, don't you think a God who's more righteous will answer his elect who cry to him day and night? I want you to look at that verse. Luke chapter 18 and verse 7. Shall not God Bring about justice for his elect 
who cry to him day and night. Are you among that number? I'll tell you, I've been a believer 57 years. There are many wonderful things God's done for me in my life. He's brought me to a life of constant rejoicing, a life of inner rest. He's brought me to a life of victory over many sins that defeated me in my life for many, many years. He's given me a very enjoyable ministry and um, been able to help thousands of people. But even now, I cry to God day and night. Believe me. I pray to God in the middle of the night. I pray to God during the day many times in the middle of my work. I'm not on my knees, but I'm crying to God in my heart and many a time because I know there's more of God's kingdom I have to possess. I want to do the maximum for God and I want God to do the maximum in me before Christ comes again. I don't want to sit back and say my sins are all forgiven I'm on my way to heaven. That's not my Christianity. My Christianity is like it says in 1 John 3, 3, those who have this hope purify themselves until they reach his standard of purity and I haven't reached that. I want to ask you how many of you cry to God day and night? You're the only ones who will benefit from what you heard this weekend. The rest of you may just remain the same and uh, you'll have tremendous regret when Christ comes again. That I can assure you. People ask me whether we're going to have regret in eternity. I don't have any doubt about it. You see, a thief on the cross may not have so much regret because he never did anything for the Lord. But he can say, Lord, I had no opportunity. I was converted just a couple of hours before I died. And those couple of hours I was on the cross. I, I wished I could have done many things for you, but I didn't have the opportunity. But those who had the opportunity and who hurt so much, the other ones are going to have regret that having known the truth, having known the sacrifice of Jesus, and having known the things that are eternal, and heard so much, they still went home and sought their own interests and lived for themselves and just kept coming back to listen to more messages that would stir them but didn't change the direction of their lives. That's what the devil would like to do in all of you, to allow you to be, to understand the truth very clearly and not only to understand but to be stirred by it and then to do nothing about it. In Jesus said something about the kingdom here. No, before that, in Luke 18, verse 8, he says, I tell you, God will bring about justice for them speedily. Take that as a promise that some of you are seeking for something, maybe a life of overcoming, maybe a life of constant rejoicing, maybe a life of inner rest. Take that and say, Lord, you said you'd bring justice for me speedily. Do it. But you need to have faith. And one mark of faith is this persistence. I will not give up until I get what I want. I think of Jacob in the Old Testament. You know, he spent his life grabbing money, grabbing sheep, grabbing women, etc. Then one day he gave it all up. He says God wrestled with him one day in Genesis 32. And now he laid hold of God. And God tested him saying, shall I go away? God said, and Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That's how I sought for the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how I continue to seek even now for more and more of the gifts and the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. I will not let you go unless you bless me. You can take away everything else, Lord, but I want the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit and greater likeness to Christ day by day. I don't want the honor of men. I don't want money. But I want the power of the Holy Spirit and greater likeness to Christ day by day. I want it and I'm willing to sacrifice anything else for it. You go to God like that. That's faith. And then the Lord said in the last part of verse 8, When the Son of Man returns, 
will he find people with such faith on the earth? I want to ask, if Jesus comes back, will he find some people here with that type of faith that says, I will not let you go unless you fulfill all the things that I've heard and understood in this weekend uh, in my life. It's not understanding that you need. You know, we had a question and answer session yesterday and maybe the things you understood, but understanding is not what we need. What we need is a passion for more of Christ in our life so that the light of God shines through our life. There are many people who don't have much understanding, but who reflect Christ in their life far more than many people who have understanding. If God has called you to be a teacher, you need understanding, but that's one in a thousand. Maybe the, in a crowd like this, God may give the gift of teaching maybe only to two people, and you may not be one of those two. But the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit to make you Christ-like, he wants to give to every one of us. So what you need is not more understanding, but more passion to be Christ-like in your life. To be more Christ-like in the way you behave towards your wife at home. Christ-like. What that means is when you are talking to your wife, you know that Jesus is between you. And you would never speak to her in a way that you'd be ashamed to let Jesus hear because he's standing right there in front of you. Do you speak like that? If not, I tell you all your knowledge of scripture is worthless. Throw it in the trash. If that's not the way you speak to your wife, if that's not the way you speak to your husband, that Jesus is there in your midst, it's useless saying that Christ is in your house. He's not in your house. But he can be. If you cry to him day and night and say, Lord, give me a life where the Holy Spirit makes the reality of Jesus there in front of me. You see, the kingdom of God is where Jesus is Lord. And you can have the kingdom of God right in your house if Jesus is Lord of your house. And you acknowledge him as king. He's the king of the kingdom. And if you acknowledge him as king in your house and you allow him to run your home. I want Jesus to be king in my home. Uh, I, when I had children in my home, I wanted to bring them up to acknowledge Jesus as king. All of them. I want to live in my home recognizing that Christ is there all the time. If there's some calamity or something goes wrong. I do exactly what the disciples did when they had a problem. They go to Jesus and say, Lord, there's a problem here. There's a storm. It looks as if we are drowning. The water's coming into the boat. Lord, I can't handle it. It's too much for me. I want you to handle it. It's so wonderful to have Jesus there in your house. But not only when there's a calamity, when things are smooth and calm, to say, Lord, you're here now. And I want to, everyone who comes to my house, I want to speak as if Jesus is there, right there. I'm his representative, and you are. And that's what you need to have a passion for, more than understanding. So many people seek for a ministry. I tell you what you should seek for, to have Christ in your home all the time. He wants to be there, where your home is a home of peace, and where all who enter you know how when there's a bad smell in the house, we put some type of perfume there, odor, uh, something that will give a good odor to people who come in. And if we see that our flesh is so corrupt, there's an odor that's not a, not a physical odor that you can smell with your noses, but a spiritual one. And the only way to remove that, to remove that is through the fragrance of Christ that the Holy Spirit brings. Let me show you this verse in one, Second Corinthians in chapter 2. The fragrance of the kingdom of God. That's what you need in your home. That's what you need in your life that people who come in touch with you get this fragrance. Second Corinthians in chapter 2 it says in verse 14, think of the life that the apostle Paul came to. When we speak about the kingdom of God, we don't use the word kingdom so much today, but it was the most common word used in the time of Jesus, the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Greece, it was because everybody, the, everywhere there was a king. Today there are very few kings. Today the word we use is government. 
It's not the kingdom of America, but the government of the United States. It's not the kingdom of India, but the government of India. So when we th use the word kingdom, sometimes we don't understand. Seek the government of God in your life. You understand that? When you live in the United States, you obey the rules of the government. You're supposed to drive on a certain side of the road. We drive on another side of the road in India. The rules, you follow the rules of your country. So if someone lived in India and drove on the left side of the road, as we do there, if he comes here, he's got to drive on the right side of the road. He's got to change completely. It's something like that when we get converted. We change a government. We, our government till then was the devil or myself. But now I'm coming under the government of God. Seek the government of God to let God govern your life. That's seeking the kingdom of God. And when God governs your life in every area, you know, in everything, think of an upright Christian would pay all his taxes in this country. He wouldn't try to cheat the government. You pay your taxes, you drive on the right side of the road, you obey the laws. And that's because you submit to the government of this country. It's exactly like that. There are certain laws in the kingdom of God and we, if you seek the government of God in your life, you'll submit to it. The only thing that is that God doesn't punish you immediately like the government here would do if you disobeyed the laws. But there is a punishment coming for all those who have violated those laws. Absolutely certain. There are many who have escaped judgment on this earth. There are rapists who never got caught and never got judged. There are murderers who escaped. There are crooks and cheats who have cheated people and cheated the country who have escaped. But they're not going to escape forever because the final judgment has not yet come. There is something beyond the Supreme Court of any country. And that's the court of God that's finally going to judge every single thing that every human being did from the time of Adam. And uh, it's all there stored in our memory and God's just got to rewind the tape and play it back and play it on a video screen in the final day. And every human being will see every single thing that you ever did from the time you were born. Nothing will be hidden. Remember, that day is coming. The Bible says in Revelation 20, the books will be opened and every man will be judged according to what he's done in his body, whether good or bad. The only thing that will not be there on that videotape, which is going to be played in the day of judgment in your life, will be what you honestly repented of, confessed to God, and asked his forgiveness and got it cleansed in the blood of Christ. That will be blotted out. So that will be blank part of the tape and uh, those sins will never be revealed in time or in eternity to anybody. This is the wonderful thing about being cleansed in the blood of Christ. But some of you may say, well, that's wonderful. Then I, all I need to do is just make sure that I confess all my sins. Nothing will be revealed. But in the day of judgment, when people see a lot of blank spaces in your tape, they'll wonder what you were doing those times. So uh, it's not exactly going to be that unembarrassing. <laughs> Huge, huge blank spaces in the videotape for hours. <laughs> it's going to be embarrassing, I'll tell you, even if it's forgiven and cleansed. The times of our ignorance God overlooks. But the time, from the time you get an understanding of the truth, God tests you very severely. He, to whom more is given, more is required. I know that I who teach you will be judged by a much higher standard than all of you. And any of you who preach or teach to others, you'll be judged by a much higher standard. But here is the fragrance that we can have. And here's the life that Paul came to. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Thanks be to God who always... Oh, it's an amazing word. You never find this word always in the Old Testament because they could not live a godly life always. They couldn't rejoice always. They couldn't pray always. They couldn't give thanks always. They couldn't be led in triumph always. Take a concordance sometime and study the word always. You'll find it in the New Testament. It's an amazing study. Here's one of those things that the, the, the apostles lived such a wonderful life. It was not in fits and starts. 
It was not sometimes up and sometimes down. Always, always giving thanks, always rejoicing, always praying, and always led in triumph in Christ. Is such a life possible? You say, no. Well, according to your faith, be it unto you. It will not be possible for you. But somebody else says, yes, it'll be possible for him. When I read it, I said, Lord, uh, yes. And I, when I first understood it, I said, Lord, I haven't got it yet, but I believe it's possible where I will always be in triumph, where I will never get angry and never lust after women and never run after money and never murmur and never complain, but always rejoice. You know, it's according to your faith. If you don't believe, I tell you, I promise you, you, you will not experience it. You live the same up and down defeated life till Jesus comes. But if you can change your vision today and say, Lord, if the Apostle Paul could get there, so can I. What you did for others, you'll do for me. And your word says, thanks be to God. It's not I who walk in triumph. Thanks be to God who leads me in triumph. It's he who does it in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma. This is what removes the bad odor. You know, the things that you put in your houses to remove bad odor or in your restrooms, you keep something to remove bad odor. It's something like that. I tell you, spiritually, a lot of our lives are like toilets that have not been flushed. I'll tell you, that's a poor picture of how filthy the flesh is. We need to flush out these toilets and have the aroma of Christ. It says the, the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place and says we are a fragrance of Christ to God first of all and among those who are being saved, among those who perish. It's God who's got to smell a fragrance from our life. Think of it like that. We are a fragrance of Christ to God. And I want to ask all of you who are sitting here, as I ask myself, are you a fragrance of Christ to God? Does God smell sweet, a sweet smell from you? It says in the Old Testament, sometimes when people offered a sacrifice, God smelt a sweet savor. It was, that was only a sacrifice. But the meaning of that was that God wants to smell this fragrance of Christ in your life. And he doesn't smell it when you're bitter. He doesn't smell it when you're angry. He doesn't smell it when you're lusting. He doesn't smell it if any of you are watching pornography. He doesn't smell it when you're complaining and grumbling or always discontent with your lot in life or jealous of somebody else who has more than you and always want something. And this bad habit that some Christians have of curiosity. Curiosity is one of those filthy sins which many Christians don't recognize as sins. Who always want to go snooping around to ask other people this question and that question and the other question. And then what happened and then what happened and then what happened. Why in the world do you want to know all those details about somebody else's life? It's an evil satanic habit. And I'm sorry to say that many Christians have it. Going around snooping around asking for question after question about question. About matters that don't concern you at all. Why in the world do you want to know all those details about somebody else's life? That's the fragrance of the devil. And you can sit in the best church in the world and have the fragrance of the devil. We've got to eliminate these things. And if that giant of curiosity has not been killed in your life yet, you can start today and say, Lord, I don't want to be curious about these things. I'll tell you, if you want to be curious, be curious about what's written in the Bible. That's a good thing to be curious about to find out that. You don't have time for that. You want to find all this information about other people. That's not the fragrance of Christ. Jesus didn't go snooping around. You know, there was a time when a woman of Samaria came. Jesus was sitting talking to a woman of Samaria. And he told her, go and call your husband. And she very honestly said, I have no husband. She was absolutely honest. She was living with a man. She could have brought him. Think of that. She could have brought him and said, this is my husband. But she was so honest and said, I've not been legally married to her, him. I'm just living with him. So, so she said, honestly, I don't have a husband. And I believe that the honesty that Jesus saw there that made Jesus lead her higher. And he said, yes, 
you have had five husbands and the one you are living with now is not your husband and she was so embarrassed to hear that that immediately she changed the subject she didn't want to proceed that that was so embarrassing she said oh by the way lord about worship i want to ask you something about worship you know she changed the subject and if it were like a lot of christians today they would say hey hang on let's deal with this matter of your husband first before we move on to worship but you see the graciousness of jesus he never touched that subject again he said okay let's talk about worship i want to ask you if you're like that or would you go snooping around and saying why did you divorce your first husband and why did what happened to the second one and what happened to the third one that's what i mean by the stink of the devil the fragrance of christ was he left it i don't want to proceed in that area that's just one example there are many many areas of what it means if you study the life of jesus in the gospels you see there's there's a fragrance about him and i i want to ask you whether you have a passion a passion to be like that never to have a demand on others in the kingdom of god we don't have any demand on others many christians have a demand they have an expectation i want you to be like this or i want you to do this for me all the conflict between husbands and wives is because there's a unspoken demand on the other christ had no demand on anyone i'll give you one example of that i'm just trying to show you the fragrance of christ this beautiful expression we are a fragrance of christ to god turn with me to john chapter 7 um those of you who have heard me before have probably heard me speak about this i don't mind repeating things that i've said many times because 75% of the people sitting here probably never heard it and those who have heard it before you can always learn something new charles finney that great evangelist once said after many years of preaching that he's discovered that people understand something fully only after they've heard it 10 times and i've tend to agree with that i've seen through the years have you noticed that sometimes when you read the bible and you read it and read it and the 10th time you read it you hit that verse hit you it's very often like that and people have told me that brother zack i i heard that message the 10th time and then i learned something which i never heard bef- understood before so if you have a humble heart always seeking to learn something new you will receive something even if you're hearing it for the 10th time In John chapter 7 it says Jesus came all the way from his home in Capernaum all those 70 miles down to Jerusalem I don't know how many days it took for him to walk sometimes you read in the bible that Jesus went to Capernaum to Jerusalem and you just read it lightly but if you look at a map it took him many days to walk there he didn't have a chariot he walked and he didn't have a home in Jerusalem so when he came to Jerusalem he stood in the temple and preached and uh, it's a place where he speaks spoke about being filled with the holy spirit in john 7:37 to 39 and uh, some of the people heard him they said boy no one ever speaks like this man verse 46 never did a man speak the way this man speaks is a very powerful messages he gave and a lot of people listened to him and they were really impressed by what they heard and then it says at the end the last verse and everyone at the end of the day everybody went to his own home but jesus went to the mount of olives did you read that the last verse of john 7 everyone went to his own home but jesus went to the mount of olives that john 8 verse 1 why was that i'll tell you nobody invited him if somebody had invited him and say lord you live in capernaum you don't have a home in jerusalem uh, where are you staying tonight not a single person who was blessed by jesus ministry thought of asking him where are you staying tonight will you come to my home can you imagine that it's never happened to me in my whole life jesus faced some things that some of us preachers have never faced in our whole life but the wonderful thing was it didn't disturb him well nobody invited me thank god it's not raining i'll go and sleep under the trees in the mount of olives no complaint 
That's what I mean by no demands. He didn't have a demand after all this preaching here and you'll be blessed by me. You don't even care where I'm going to sleep tonight. No demand. Are you like that? That you have no demands on others even after you've served them? That's the fragrance of Christ. And we read the next morning, verse 2, early in the morning, he came back into the temple, John 8, verse 2, and he sat down. Do you know that Jesus preached most of his sermons sitting down? He sat down and began to teach them. And again, nobody thought of asking him, hey, by the way, I forgot to ask you, Lord, where did you sleep last night? Nobody asked him. It didn't disturb him. It didn't disturb him that the people who listened to him were so inconsiderate and thoughtless because he never had a demand on anybody. I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that is part of the fragrance of Christ. These are little, little snippets that you see in the Gospels. And if you ask the Holy Spirit to show you, to open your eyes in these little parts of Scripture to show you the beauty of Jesus, it's not written in plain language because God hides these things from the clever and the intelligent. He reveals them to babes who are humbly seeking to see the fragrance of Christ in the Gospels. And there are many places like this I could show you where you see the beauty of Jesus Christ in little things, but you've got to search for them. They're not on the surface. There are things on the surface of the earth which are good like apples and oranges and all you can pluck. But you know that the most expensive things on earth are not on the surface. Gold and diamonds are never found on the surface of the earth. You've got to dig thousands of feet into the ground to get it. There are things on the surface, like I said, fruits and vegetables, but the most valuable things are deep down. It's like that in scripture. There are things you can read scripture through quickly and you can get something, but the most valuable things in scripture are deep down and they are given to those who really meditate on it. Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. They get the riches of scripture. Do you remember what God told Adam? By the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread. In other words, if you're going to be lazy, Adam, you'll get nothing. But if you work hard, you can earn bread. And if you want the bread of God in scripture, you've got to sweat for it. If you just superficially read it, you won't get the riches of God. And I want to say that 90% or more of Christians I've met in my life read scripture superficially. And that's why they're so pathetically poor because God sees that they treat his word so lightly. If you believe there's only one book that God's written for man and uh, you've been a Christian for two years, two years, you've been born again and you haven't read through the Bible, I'll tell you what you should do. You should go home and hang your head in shame and say, Lord, I'm ashamed of myself. I've been converted for two years and I haven't read through the Bible even once. I was converted in 1959 and I decided that I'll read through the Bible and I read through it in six months, the whole Bible. I didn't understand most of it, but I read it. And I read it again and again and again and again and again. I was not interested in going through the Bible 50 times. I was more interested in the Bible going through me at least once. And even my passion is this, that the Bible go through me and that I will see the beauty of Jesus in Scripture so that the Holy Spirit can make me like Him. If you don't see the glory of Jesus in Scripture, the Holy Spirit cannot make you like Him. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians in chapter 3 and verse 18. What does it mean to seek God's kingdom first and His righteousness? Here it is, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We with unveiled face as in a mirror. Mirror is the word of God. And uh, we see the glory of the Lord in scripture. When you read scripture, what do you find there? Do you find a law? I used to. And it brought me into bondage. It became a weapon for me to preach to other people. To hit them on the head with. But no longer. Today when I read, look into the mirror... I see the glory of Jesus Christ. I see the glory of Jesus from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You read that when, the, when Jesus walked with the disciples to Emmaus, he opened up the scriptures. It was Genesis to Malachi those days. 
And it says, in every scripture, he showed them Christ, the Messiah. That's amazing. And their hearts burned as they saw Jesus. I mean, they had read the Bible, the Genesis to Malachi, but they never saw. But Jesus opened their eyes to say, do you see that? You see that over there in Exodus? You see that in Numbers? You see that in Leviticus? Do you see that in Deuteronomy? And their hearts burned as they saw Christ in all the scriptures. That's one of the burdens with which I wrote that commentary that's there on the table called Through the Bible to see what the Lord has to speak to us so that we can have the fragrance of Christ coming through us. I want to urge you, my brothers, when you read the Bible, ask God to show you the glory of Jesus Christ. And then it says here, the Holy Spirit, the next thing he does is transform us into the same image. So the two ministries of the Holy Spirit. This is the most, in all my study of the scriptures, this verse describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit most completely. Number one, to show me the glory of Jesus in the scriptures. And if you don't read the Bible, you won't see it. And secondly, to transform me into that likeness, not only in character, but in ministry. I don't have all the gifts of the Spirit that Jesus had, but God's given me a ministry in the body of Christ, and I want to tell you God's given you a ministry too. If you're not born again, then of course you don't have, you're not part of the body of Christ. But if you're born again, even if you were born again this morning, God's got a specific function for you in the body of Christ, and you've got to ask God to show you what it is. And He'll show you what it is if you seek to see Jesus in the Scriptures. Because you will see that glory and the Holy Spirit will change you into that likeness first in your character and then he will show you that particular ministry he has for you. I don't care how ignorant you are, how stupid you are and how little you've been, you maybe how briefly you've been converted. The Holy Spirit has got something for you to do in the body of Christ. And first of all to manifest the fragrance of Christ in your home. How many of you will be passionate from this day onwards? Say, Lord, I want to manifest the fragrance of Christ in my home. It's been a stinking odor that's come out of me, like restrooms that have not been flushed. That's the odor that's come out of me for so many years in my home. My wife has smelt it. My husband has smelt it. My children have smelt it. And I'm sick and tired of it. I'm so careful to put some perfume odor in the restrooms in the house but what about the odor that's coming out of me Lord I'm ashamed and I don't want it to be like that anymore I hope some of you will really be ashamed I, I was so sick and tired of my life defeated life of the filthy odor coming out of my life I said Lord I don't want it to be like that anymore I cannot produce this perfume but the Holy Spirit can and if you submit to the Holy Spirit that's why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit not to just get an emotional experience, not to speak in tongues. It doesn't matter if you don't speak in tongues in all of your life. Jesus never spoke in tongues. That's not the most important thing. But there was a fragrance of Christ that there was there. And that's what God wants to smell. And he wants to smell it in you and me. That's the main purpose with which he sent us the Holy Spirit. That the fragrance of Christ can come forth. So seek for it with all your heart. And I want to say this that the glory of Christ cannot be shown all by myself. I'm, that's why he's put me in a body. There are parts of Christ that I cannot manifest all by myself. When God made Adam, it's as it were he told Adam, listen, you cannot reflect my image completely. If I were to paraphrase God's words, you need a woman to be your partner and together you can show my image. There's, it's like, as it were, God told Adam, you may be a wonderful man, but by yourself, there are aspects of, of, what, of the image of God that a man cannot manifest. He needs a woman to manifest. That's why God has put men and women in the church. And that's why a wife is as important as a husband in the home to manifest the image of God. God is a mother. And 
No man can manifest the tenderness of a mother like a woman can. Isaiah 49.15 says very clearly, Isaiah 49.15, God says, Can a mother forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? A father may forget, but not a mother. Even they may forget, but I will not forget you, says the Lord. So there the Lord is comparing himself to a mother. When he wants to show his compassion, he doesn't take the ex example of a father primarily, but a mother who cannot forget her sucking child. There is an aspect of God that cannot be manifested by man alone. So don't ever despise your wife. Don't despise the sisters in the church. They're, they're manifesting an aspect of the image of God which no man can. That's why God's put a balance. And it's not only man and woman. That's how it was when he first created a man. And he said, you need a helper to manifest my image. But in the New Testament church, he has put people of completely different temperaments. Some of you are extroverts. You know, you are the type of person who can slap a person on the back and say, hi, and um, some of you are so introverts, you're so shy and withdrawn. Uh, you sit quietly when everybody else is speaking. Don't despise them. All of them are necessary. I've discovered if I want to get a job done in my church, and I, I want someone who will do it methodically, faithfully, I would choose an introvert. Extroverts do their work very shallow, in a shallow way. These people who are happy-go-lucky always what they say, the life of the party. They may be the life of the party, but you give them a job to do, they won't do it perfectly. They'll do it in a slipshod way. But you, you look at this introvert who's always looking inside. You give him a job to do, he'll do it perfectly. Any day, I'd rather give it to him. Everyone is needed. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't despise that other person who's different from you. Maybe you're an extrovert and God's called you to be an evangelist. Evangelists, extra, extroverts need, you need to have that personality to be an evangelist, to reach out to people. But you who don't have that temperament, don't despise yourself. Because God has a plan for you too. Maybe to sit patiently with a person and counsel a person. And encourage that person in personal counseling. So every person in the body of Christ has a ministry. And the kingdom of God let me show you this verse in Luke chapter 9. I mentioned it the other day. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, in verse 27, I say to you truthfully, there are some who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And I quoted that verse also from Mark's gospel in chapter 9 in verse 1 where there's one more word added, Mark 9, verse 1. I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. This word is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke three times. That's not vain repetition. The kingdom of God came with power when some of those people standing there in front of Jesus had not died yet. And that happened on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came with power on those people. So what happened on those 120 people meeting together was the church was formed, and the church was to be a representative of the kingdom of God on earth. One day this kingdom will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But right now, here's a sample. So when people come into your church, they should be able to see something of what the reign of Christ will be one day when he rules the whole, un whole earth. Do they see that in your church? Or do they see strife, confusion, boring meetings where people who don't seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit seek to get up and impress people with their knowledge and don't prepare properly for their ministry? There's a lot of that today. A lot of that. Because they don't take, they, they prepare more for their earthly jobs. Teachers who are teaching in colleges study harder for their lectures they have to give to their students that many who serve God study the scriptures in order to preach God's word. It's an absolute shame. 
It's an absolute shame. We don't seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Who think they can do God's work with their human cleverness. They should go and hang their head in shame. The church is a place where the spirit of the kingdom of God is to be manifested. That's the meaning of that verse. The kingdom of God with power. Where is it got to be seen? In the church. It's not in the world. So when people come to your church, they must go away saying, like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, truly God is in your midst. They should go away saying, not, I heard a clever sermon, but I met with Jesus. If they haven't met with Jesus in your church service, your church service was a failure. You might as well not have had it. If they just had some entertainment with some good singing and a clever sermon, that's not it. They must go away feeling the Lord spoke to me. He was there in our midst. I couldn't see him, but he spoke to my heart. I could sense his presence. And one mark of his presence is this. The disciples in Emmaus, you read in Luke 24, that when they went home, they said to each other, when Jesus talked to them for nearly three hours, you know, the distance from Jerusalem to Emmaus is about seven miles or more. And it, it took them about two, three hours to walk that distance. Imagine listening to Jesus preaching for three hours. And it wasn't a boring sermon. They said our hearts were burning when he spoke to us. I remember when as a young preacher and I read that verse. And I said, Lord, to me that is the mark that Jesus is speaking in a meeting. That people's hearts will burn and they won't forget it. And Lord, I say that's the only way I want to preach in all my life. I don't want to preach clever sermons. I don't want people to be interested with, uh, impressed with my intellect or even the knowledge of verses or any such thing. If their hearts don't burn, I have failed in my ministry. I say that to myself again and again. If people's hearts don't burn, if Jesus doesn't speak to them, convict them, if they don't sense they have met with Christ and they go away, I have failed in my ministry. And I've gone, I'll tell you honestly, I've gone and repented and wept before God many, many times in the last 50 years when it's not been like that. And said, Lord, I will not let you go until you so anoint me with your Holy Spirit that there'll be a fire in my life. And I want to say to every one of you, even if you share God's word for five minutes, pray that there'll be a fire in your life. Not the fire of human emotion and like many American preachers running up and down a platform. I cannot imagine Jesus running up and down a platform with a mic. I think most of the time he was sitting down. But there was a fire in his preaching. Whether he was walking down the road talking to those disciples or anywhere. I plead with you. The time is short. Christ is coming back. There's a great famine of the word of God everywhere. And those of you who are called to speak God's word. Please seek God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And say, Lord, I want a manifestation of the kingdom of God in our church. A kingdom where there's one law, and that's the law of love, the law of forgiveness and love. Do you know one day, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom where everything will be run by the law of love. And today he's preparing us to be a part of that kingdom. And that's why he brings you into circumstances where he makes you love people who don't treat you in love, but you respond in love. And that's how he's preparing you to rule in a kingdom one day where everything will be governed by the law of love. And now he's training you for that kingdom. Don't fail the test. He's preparing you for rulership in a kingdom where you're not going to be like a big authority hitting people on the head, but you're going to love people. It's the rule of love that's going to run God's kingdom one day on this earth and in heaven. And he's preparing people for that type of authority. Very different from the authority in the Gentiles and the worldly people, where they like to lord it over people. So if you find yourself in a situation where people are evil to you, respond in love. 
And that's how he'll prepare you for that future kingdom. And the Lord is preparing people. So I want to say one more thing in this connection, and that is, you know, there are, in, in this kingdom, there is no distinction. Let me show you in Colossians chapter 3 how he's building his body. In Colossians in chapter 3, he says about this body. In Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 10, he says, This new self is renewed according to the true knowledge of the one of the image of the one who created him. And in this renewal, there is no distinction. It's very important to understand this. Many times Paul says this, there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. In, the, in those days, the world was divided and the Jews thought of everybody else is a Gentile and we are the Jews. They call them Greeks or Gentiles. There were only two, for the Jews, there were only two groups of people in the world, Jews and non-Jews. And the non-Jews were called Gentiles or Greeks. And for 1,500 years, the Jews were a special people on the face of the earth. And God's people were only the Jews. But when Jesus stretched out his hand on Calvary's cross, he broke that dividing wall between the Jews and the rest of the world. And he says, there's no more dividing wall, you're one. There is no distinction between non-Jew and Jew, between circumcised and uncircumcised. Now, I want to say that there are some Christians who are blind to this. There are Christians who are sitting in Israel saying that God is a special place for the Jews. They're taking them back to pre-Pentecost days. That's a deception. The Bible says there is no distinction between Jew and non-Jew, between circumcised and non uncircumcised, between barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man. Christ is all and in all. You see, there was a time when there was slavery in this country. And there was a distinction between those who were slaves and their slave masters. But then that was destroyed. And even though that was destroyed many years ago, some people still look down on others um, as though they're slaves. It's something like that. There's a distinction there was for years between the Jew and the non-Jew which Jesus destroyed. And there are people building it up again because they are blind. There's no distinction between the Greek and the barbarian. And that's the beauty of the church of Jesus Christ in which there is no distinction. So if you find yourself drawn only to people who think like you. You haven't understood the church. I want to tell you that. You're like the Jews who, and maybe in your case it's not Jews, maybe you say people of my community. Those are the ones I, well, the, the Jews were like that. I like to have a church only of Jews. I find that there are people like that. They have church of only the Hungarians, only the Russians, or only the Romanians, or only the Indians, and among the Indians, only the Malayalis, or only the Telugus. I remember when my children, my four sons, came to the U.S., one of the things I told them was, never join an Indian church, please. Indian churches are in India, not in America. If you live here, you must join a local church, which is an expression of the body of Christ, not a bunch of people who speak the same language, who have got the same culture. That's a club. It's not a church. People who are the same community, same language, they come together because we feel comfortable with people in our own language. Fine, that's a club. Call it a club. Don't call it the Church of Jesus Christ. That's a disgrace to call it the Church of Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as a Romanian church or a Hungarian church or an Indian church or a Malayali church or a, or a Telugu church or an American church. There is only one church in the Church of Jesus Christ. And in that church, there's no distinction between the Greek and the barbarian. That's the kingdom of God that has come with power. It was not like that before the day of Pentecost. Jesus, some of you standing here will see that day, he said, when the kingdom of God will come with power. Are you seeking that kingdom first? Are you seeking it with all your heart to build a church which is, runs according to the principle of the kingdom of God where there's no distinction that you, you can look at a brother or a sister who's from a completely different race, who completely uncultured, and you can love him. Because Christ is in him. Think of a cultured Greek. The Greek were the most cultured people in the first century. 
And think of having him sit next to a barbarian, uncouth barbarian with all his crude ways and his crude language and crude habits, and they're sitting in the same church. That's an absolute miracle which Jesus did. I remember when we started church, building the church in India, this is what we decided. Not, a lot of people think all Indians are the same. They're not. We are as diverse as Europeans. You know, there's a lot of difference between Norwegians and Italians and Spaniards and Germans. It's exactly like that. In India is like a continent with different races, different cultures, different 22 languages. And when God began to build a church there, we decided we're not going to stick to our own language or community. We're not going to stick to just educated people. So it's all going to be the same, educated or uneducated. And so we have in our church people of different races, different cultures, and PhDs and illiterate. Illiterate means those who can't read and write in the same church. We love one another. There's no distinction. Every distinction has been broken down. And Paul was so insistent on this. Let me show you a few places. In Romans, in chapter 3. He says here, there is no distinction. Romans 3.22. He begins the chapter with what advantage has the Jew? Yes, he's got the benefit of circumcision and he had a lot of privileges because he had the word of God. But ultimately he says, there in verse 22, there is no distinction. What does it matter whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew? Verse 23, you've all sinned and you all need forgiveness. There is no special place anymore for the Jew. Or in Ephesians. This is one of the great things Paul fought for. Every letter almost he mentions it. Uh, let's turn to Galatians. And Galatians in chapter 3, he says in verse 28, Galatians 3, 28, There is no Jew or non-Jew. There is no slave or free man. There's no male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Who said Abraham's offspring were only those who came through Isaac and Jacob? If you belong to Christ, you're part of that. This is what we need to see. And Paul fought for it. And you know what he said? If someone, turn to this, verse Galatians chapter 1. If we, verse 8, or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel to you, saying there's a distinction between the Jew and the non-Jew today, let him be accursed. I say that. If somebody tries to bring a distinction today between the Jew and the non-Jew, let him be accursed. Because he says there's no distinction. Jesus broke down those di distinctions. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. It's amazing how people have ignored scripture after scripture after scripture today. They talk about Messianic Jews. What do you mean Messianic Jews? There are Christians and non-Christians. That's all. Children of God and children of the devil. You never find the word Messianic Jews in the, in the Bible. Messianic Indians, Messianic Americans. What's all that? There are Christians and non-Christians. There are children of God and children of the devil. But all these expressions come up and foolish Christians who haven't studied the Bible get taken up with it. Some new fad. Sometimes it's uh, uncontrollable laughing. Sometimes it's people falling on the ground. Something or the other. The devil has always got some new fad to lead Christians astray from the simple gospel of salvation through Christ, being filled with the Holy Spirit and building a body where there's no distinction. Ephesians chapter 2. See what it says. Now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you Gentiles who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in his flesh, and in verse 14, he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. There's a lot of dividing walls that have come among, that, God, that the devil has brought between people of different communities, languages, education levels, etc., etc., etc. And Jesus broke down every dividing wall and he abolished everything that separated two people and he made the last part of verse 15 made the two into one reconciling both non-jew and jew in christ breaking down every distinction yeah i could show you many more verses like that and then i want to show you this thing galatians 2 and verse 19 18 galatians 2 18 if I rebuild what was once destroyed, I'm a transgressor. Jesus broke down a wall between people of different races, 
between Jews and non-Jews, and I again build that wall and say, the Jews are a special people. I want to say it in Jesus' name to you, you that you're a transgressor. That's what the Bible says in Galatians 2.18. And don't you bully any, any of that rubbish. Jesus is building his body these days, and the devil is doing everything to bring dividing walls again between them, dividing walls of culture, language, race, Jew, non-Jew, and uh, keep the Sabbath again. Keep the Sabbath again? Do you know that Jesus buried the Sabbath on the Sabbath day? Where was he on the Sabbath day? In the grave. He, he was buried on the Sabbath, to, Sabbath day to prove that I finished with the Sabbath. And he rose again on the first day to begin a new creation. Don't ever forget that. Don't go back to all that old covenant stuff. And there's no difference between that and the people who preach the health, wealth gospel. That is contrary to the kingdom of God. So when we seek God's kingdom first, he's going to bring us into conflict with a lot of people who call themselves believers because they don't accept the whole of scripture. That's why we need to know the scriptures. I believe God's doing a wonderful work. I mean, just think of the crowd here. How many communities there are here? Some of you who are even, you call yourself Americans, but you come from many other, many parts of Europe. You probably come from Ireland and Germany and Hungary and Romania and you live here. There are people here from Korea and China and different parts of India who are different races, completely different races and many, many more from Brazil and South America and all here in such a small crowd and we are one in Christ. And it's a wonderful thing if in your heart you can open your heart and in your local area that you don't ever again join a communal club and call it the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, if a person cannot understand a language, then I can understand why they have to meet in a church where they speak that language because they can't understand English. But that's not the thing. I see among the Indian community, people who can speak very good English, who work with English in their offices, but they'll gather with people of their own particular language that's a club it's a definitely a club people from different countries in Europe who speak English very well but they want to gather with their own community why is that building again barriers that Jesus broke down on the cross I never want to do it I don't want to be a transgressor to me, seeking the kingdom of God first is not just righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit in my personal life. I think of what Jesus said. Some of you standing here will not die till you see the kingdom of God come with power. And I see that happen on the day of Pentecost. And everything subsequent to that. You know the tremendous problem that Peter had to break down that wall between him and the Gentiles that he couldn't even go to Cornelius' house till he got a vision. And even after he got the vision, once... He was so scared of what the others would say and he went and sat with the Jews eating uh, a meal with them and Paul had to get up and rebuke that senior apostle Peter. You read that in Galatians 2. I really love Paul. He wasn't scared of anybody. If it wasn't for him, I tell you, all these barriers would have been built. He's one of my great heroes in the New Testament. Imagine rebuking an apostle 10 years older than you and say, why in the world are you scared, Peter? Why you were eating with the Gentiles five minutes ago and suddenly you moved to the table of the Jews just because James sent some people here? You're scared of him? Are you, is this what we are preaching? That we are preaching that Christ has broken down the dividing wall and you go and sit at another table? It's happening today. Beware of it. Steer clear of it. And if some people want to go that way and live in their blindness, that's up to them. But don't you be blind and don't build those barriers of those dividing walls again. I have no hesitation in speaking frank frankly about this. I can imagine if the Apostle Paul were here today and he saw the type of things happening, he would speak st even stronger than me. Seek the kingdom of God where there's no distinction between any race, anything. We are one in Christ. And that's what Jesus is trying to manifest around the world today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to glorify your name. Please help us to live according to the light of your word.
to break down the prejudices we have in our mind, and we have so many of them because of our upbringing and culture and false theology and a lot of rubbish like that. Break it all down, Lord, we pray, and help us to know you better, to seek your kingdom with all of our heart, that our church can be a representation, each of our local churches will be a representation of the kingdom of God with power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.